I first met Sparrow at Esalen at a Sun Poetry Workshop, and then I went for the next four years, and I, I was uh, really impressed by the topics he chose, <laughs> and also the way he grunted and laughed, <laughs> and um, made uh, he ha he made us dance and sing too, and uh, all of that means a lot to me because. I, I came to poetry pulling together things that were most important to me in my life, and that was um, dance, drama, theater, color, and music, and then languages. Thank you both so much. Oh. To begin the conversation, I'd like to talk about the Princeton Diary broadly. Uh, what are some of the, the key themes of this book in, in your view, Sparrow? Well, I, I think I'm gonna start by just describing what the book is. So, uh, so it's a novella. The publisher didn't really clearly indicate that it's fiction, except in this little <laughs> tiny note on the third page. And I was interviewed by somebody and she said to me, oh, I see you won the McAllister Award. And I said, no, that's a person in my book won the McAllister <laughs> Award. This is a work of fiction, it's a novella. In other words, a short novel. Has these brilliant uh, drawings by me. And, um, and so it, it's a diary, like it says in the title. It's the diary of a professor at Princeton, this guy named Kalabakis, who's, that's his name, right? Kalabakis. Kalabak Kalabakis, I think. Uh, he's, uh, we just learned his last name. We never learn his first name. He, uh, he's Lithuanian, not Greek. Everybody thinks he's Greek, but he's really Lithuanian. I mean, he's American, but you know, Lithuanian American, you might say. Um, so he has a three year appointment at Princeton. He's gonna be there for three years and he's somewhere in the midst of that, you know, uh, uh, you know, job. But it's a little unclear in the book where, whether it's at the beginning or the end. Of it. And, and that after that, he has no idea what's gonna happen with his life. And doesn't seem terribly interested in what's gonna happen after that. He's very divorced. He has no friends. He's an atheist. He goes to the atheist club, possibly with the desire to find a woman. Um, he, he has writer's block. He's a novella writer. He's written these four books that have all have these ridiculous one word titles. And, uh, and he wants to write more. Oh yeah, one is called Damp. One is called Plus. One is called Bale, like a bale of hay. One is called Silver. You know, he's sort of wants to be a normal literary writer, but he has complete and utter writer's block. So which manifests that every day he writes for two hours obsessively without, without fail. And he pays himself $3 an hour. And then he writes and then he tears it up or he writes nothing. For a while he starts doing mathematical problems. But he always does those two hours. He always pays himself $6. And I get the feeling every day he's got to spend that $6. So this is him talking, Kalavak is talking about his life. So it's so something of an irony that he it has writer's block, but he wrote this book. This book is his, you know, kind of notes he's making to himself about his daily life. What are the themes of it? Well, I mean, to me, one, one of the things, I mean, I when I was writing it, I didn't really have a thought at all about it. But now that I have to think about it and occasionally talk about it, I seems to me that the book is kind of a fable about failure. It's kind of like you fail at everything in life and you're still alive, you're still there. And what do you do at that point? What do you do when you fail? What, what, what happens after that point? Um, and this is kind of, a, kind of a discussion, kind of an examination of what, what, what happens after failure. Okay, so success and failure. Why Joyce Carol Oates? 
Yeah, I forgot to say, so there's sort of one figure in his life that he's kind of obsessed with. So Joyce Carol Oates, maybe you don't know, you know if you're younger than 70, but Joyce Carol is a world famous writer who's written the most books of anyone, who's a literary writer. She's written the most of any literary writer. I, and in the book, I go on a website. I mean, the guy goes on the website and he calculates <laughs> how many she's written. I calculated she's written 135 books, but that doesn't include uh, anthology. She's edited things. She's, you know, she sometimes writes, uh, what's the word, under pseudonyms. So, um, so she's a famous uh, character, a famous professor at Princeton. And at once a month, uh, Kalavakis has uh, lunch with her and he becomes obsessed with, with those meetings. And, those, and he basically spends his life trying to think of new things to entertain Joyce Carol Oates. So why did I choose her? I don't remember. I, I think I decided impulsively to set the book at Princeton. And then I thought, I guess if he's in Princeton, he's got to hang out with Joyce Carol Oates. And it happens that I met Joyce Carol Oates twice, and uh, very briefly. And uh, well, kind of at events like this, actually, where she gave book talks. And uh, she did fascinate me. She's a fascinating being to me. So maybe that, I don't think of myself as, you know, holding it in my mind, oh, I've got to try to figure out Joyce Carol Oates for the rest of my life. But maybe some part of me, She's very small, kind of childlike. She has giant eyes. She's very old now. That is to say, she's older than me. And uh, she, um, there's something very delicate about her and she always seems a little scared. Um, this is Joyce Carol or something. And uh, I don't know, you know, something, and also, you know, I was thinking about it the other day, I was thinking she, She's a person who's written 135 books who seems utterly to act to lack narcissism, which is, I think, interesting. <laughs> so how do you figure out that Kalavakis also seductive? Yeah, Kalavakis kind of, well, you know, I hate to talk about this in public, but <laughs> he starts thinking about it when he's masturbating. And there's a lot of like Joyce Carol Oates masturbation fantasies in this book. And they're not that elaborate, you know, like in one sentence each. And Lee, the other day, because we we really like deeply prepared for this event. So the other day when we were preparing, Lee like read me the like progression <laughs> of masturbations with Joyce Carol Oates. Um, and they're pretty strange. <laughs> um, she's sort of holding different objects, different points, different masturbations. Uh, why does, I, I'm not clear what Kalabakis wants out of Joyce Carol Oates. He doesn't seem to like her writing. And that way, Kalabakis is like me. I don't like her writing. He even ridicules, he like ridicules her writing in the book. I noticed today when I was looking through the book, but he, he gets one of her books out of the library. He, quotes the first passage, the first paragraph, and he says, it sounds like she wrote this on the way to the Orthodox. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Like, it, you know, it just, she just doesn't, you know, she writes too much. She doesn't take much time with it, seems to me. And also it seems to Kalabakas who tears up everything he writes. And I, I think that, I think that he might be in love with her in a certain way. And she floats over him during these sequences. And, <laughs> yeah, and she carries different things. First a sword, then a gun. Then she writes with a magic marker on his bum. And then at the very end, she coughs, which Kalavakis says that men do. He says, women cry and men cough. <laughs> yeah, which is true, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've been in situations, I'm a man, I guess, and. Uh, you know, situations where I should cry and I can't. And, you know, it's a tragedy being a man, in America anyway, where you really can't cry. It's not true that men cough, but it's almost true. Cough rather than cry. It's, it's close to being true. I mean, I, this book might be filled with observations that are almost true. 
<laughs> okay, Atheist Club. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's just funny to me because I am, uh, you know, been involved in meditation all these years. I'm kind of a, I'm a sort of a self-hating new age person, you know, and, uh, and I, for some reason, I decided to make Kalabakis an atheist, uh, like a serious, you know, I don't know what the word is, committed atheist. <laughs> And I don't know why he goes to this atheist club. Possibly he's looking for some kind of sense of community. He seems kind of intellectually interested in the subject matter. There's a great book by Freud. Like it happens where I, I live kind of right near a, a creek and the creek periodically floods, floods my garage and floods. I live in a double wide trailer. So it floods the, what do you call it? Crawl space under the trailer and then to take out the duck, the heating ducks, you know, it's very whatever, defeating in a way. And uh, one of the first flood was the, the day the Pope died, the Pope, the Polish Pope, I think. And uh, it was like 2004. And uh, what is my point? Ah, I was in the middle of reading this great book by Freud. It's called The Future of an Illusion. It's the best book about uh, atheism completely convincing argument for atheism. Uh, I mean, I'm not an atheist. I'm not a, I'm sort of an agnostic. I've come to feel that I can't, have no idea what is true and is untrue. But Kalabanka seems fairly sure. Well, I'm gonna read a part where he talks about doubt. So, but he seems, but I don't know, for some reason he likes to go to the atheist side. It just sort of seems maybe like that's what you would do at Princeton. <laughs> I mean, it happens that I flunked out of Cornell, so, and my wife graduated from Dartmouth, uh, summa cum laude. So we're like an Ivy League couple. So I, I spent a little time. I think that we might be the most unsuccessful Ivy League couple in the world, you know, financially speaking. Um, and, and maybe in other ways. <laughs> uh, so I was at Cornell and I have like a little bit of a sense of what the Ivy League is like. I think that Princeton is probably the worst Ivy League couple. <laughs> I have a lot of like hatred. I went to Princeton, the town once, and I just thought it was like horrifying, like uh, cute, fake. It's like a quaint little English village that was constructed 12 years ago. It's just like a horribly, you know, nauseating place to my mind. So maybe that was why I set the book there. <laughs> read about doubt. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'll read. Now, I'll, is that okay, Shady? Please. Yeah. So I'm going to read a little. So the book is a diary. It's just in, uh, what's the word? The order that things in a diary are. So I'm going to read a, like a little section that begins here, where he talks about his ex-wife. He has this ex-wife that really hates him. <clears throat> I'll stand up. My ex-wife was allergic to me, not literally, but metaphorically. At first, she mistook this allergy for attraction. But after living together for six weeks, everything I did appalled her. She liked me personally, but was helpless before her revulsion. Eventually, she asked me to leave for her own health. Of course, I agreed. I don't believe in genius. Even Shakespeare had to write play after play, year after year, until he stumbled upon brilliance. If Shakespeare was a true genius, how could he have written the life and death of King John? I've begun to picture Joyce Carol Oates while I'm masturbating. I don't see myself having sex with her, Rather, I picture her in a white shroud standing above me. As I moan, she looks down, frowning. Everything on earth has a longitude and latitude, even a glass of milk. I get car sick, seasick, and horse sick. That is, I become nauseous while riding on a horse. But air travel doesn't disturb me. Taking an airplane is not like traveling. It's more like sitting 
still while the world revolves beneath you. In the 19th century, if an audience wildly applauded the movement of a symphony, the conductor would play it again. Has anyone tried that in literature? After the best chapter of your novel, leave a blank page, then repeat it. <laughs> Today I heard a bird say, spe, 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 spe. It's about 50 more spes, but I'll <laughs> give you a break here. Last night I dreamed that the stores in Princeton were closing, not for the evening, but forever. As I walked down the streets, one store after another was empty, a flower shop, a deli, a bookstore. It was a Princeton apocalypse. I've always loved the phrase door prize. Most of us forget if we ever knew that the sky is divided into lanes for airplanes to ride through, like trucks on a highway. The firmament has been mapped as precisely as Arizona. The last time I spoke to Joyce CPO, she said, we don't need the Ku Klux Klan anymore. We have the police. Mm -hmm. She makes these radical remarks sometimes. I made a successful Greek salad. Red romaine lettuce, grape tomatoes, Greek olives, feta cheese, golden raisins. A triumph. My secret, a tiny pinch of cinnamon. Religious people are fond of saying, you must have faith in something. But that's untrue. You can enter an abandoned house and proceed tentatively across the floor, fearful that it may collapse. You can walk without trust. In fact, it's wiser to do so. Doubt may be your guide as much as faith. Pillows have faces. You can definitely see mouths and eyes even nostrils, it's quite possible by manipulating a pillow to give it a human expression. You can teach a pillow to smile. So, <coughs> so yeah, <laughs> wonderful images, wonderful images. And I love the doubt and faith combination. So it brings up the question of style and <laughs> I said to you, this feels like a pastiche of Burks. <laughs> you know, it's <clears throat> success and failure. It's Joyce Carol Oates. It's food you make. <laughs> it's your thoughts about religion. Do what music, which we're going to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> and funny phrases and words. So talk about that pastiche. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, it's funny to me that, uh, you know, I write these books. Oh, yeah, I know what I was going to say. Some friend of mine emailed me the other day. I gave her a different book of mine, but this kind of pamphlet published in uh, Berlin called uh, Fake Wisdom. And she said, uh, your book is brilliant. Everyone leaves the bathroom smiling. <laughs> and, uh, and basically, the, everything I write uh, is meant to be read in the bathroom. You know, it's all kind of things. You know, there's a famous uh, movie called The Big Chill, and this guy works at People Magazine, and he says, uh, an article at People Magazine should be the same length as a shit, <laughs> as it takes you to shit, and uh, which I think is, you know, completely accurate. Mine are even, you can pee, you know, <laughs> they're like, you know, they're, they're that short. And, um, you know, I, this is just, um, for better or worse, uh, this is the way my mind works. I can never think of more than a paragraph to say about anything. It's somehow, sometimes I can force my ideas together into 
what looks, you know, can sort of pass as an essay, as an extended series of thoughts, but it's really just a bunch of one paragraphs kind of pushed together somewhat convincingly or unconvincingly. It's, um, you know, it's funny to me because I live in the country, I do meditation and I have like the same attention span as, I don't have a TV, you know, I have the same attention span as everyone, maybe a worse attention span uh, as an American. So it's, it's maybe just living here, you get that attention span. I know I've gotten to the point where like, I'm a kind of a YouTube addict. And I feel like if so, a song is four minutes and 29 seconds, it's like, that's too much of a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I think in like whatever the equivalent of a Cardi B song. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I write these things. So I have a very ritualized life, uh, which and you know, my wife is patient. She also is a writer, though I don't call myself a writer, but. Um, so every day until 12.01, like until a minute after noon, I don't talk to anybody. And I just wake up, think about my dreams, which I usually remember. And um, then I maybe lie in bed for a while thinking thoughts. And if some of the thoughts interest me, I'll go to my computer and say them because I have carpal tunnel syndrome. So I use a uh, voice activated computer. So I'm actually not a writer, I'm like a thinker and talker to a computer. So I, um, you know, so that's, you know, that I, I guess I wrote, I don't remember writing this book very clearly, but I guess that's how I wrote this book. So it's, you know, it, it, why it works as a book, if it does, kind of mystifies me. You know, I think that to some extent, I really kind of felt that I, I felt this person, Kalavakis, I sort of, would write things that I thought he would write. You know, I put most of the stuff that really happened to me. So what aspects are Kalavakis and what could be aspects of Sparrow? I mean, the one thing that I'm sort of worried about putting in the book was I was going to this comedy club in the East Village in Manhattan, which is a neighborhood kind of like this one. And, um, there was a big fire in a tenement. I couldn't go, they closed the bar. Uh, so I couldn't go to my comedy club. And I just watched this fire, which was, you know, terrifying and fascinating. And I put the fire in the book and I, I sort of feel like there are never fires in Princeton. Like it's sort of impossible that anything in Princeton could catch on fire. But I just put it anyway. That is the one thing that is maybe a little bit more me than Kalavakis. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know that, you know, I, I put less nature. I wrote a book before this, a novel called Abraham. That's kind of pretty hard to find. But uh, that book is more of it. And that guy lived, the person I was writing in the voice of lived where I lived. And so that became something of a nature journal even though I don't really think about nature that much, but I sort of force myself to, uh, to write this book. And this book has less nature in it because I felt like Kalavakis is living in some kind of like apartment complex, some horrible place, um, maybe on the edge of Princeton. So I didn't want to put too much um, nature into it. Except, <laughs> <laughs> I will say that you and I have talked about talking to trees oh. and um, I watch birds and trees and clouds especially mm. and um, so do they have souls? Uh, trees have something. I mean clouds have souls. Seems a little bit of a stretch. I mean I'm a little bit of a I mean, I'm not a Buddhist, but I'm very respectful of Buddhism, which is very big on the idea that people don't have souls. So I don't, the whole concept of a soul, there's something about it, it's a little Christian in my mind. I don't know. I don't like the idea of souls. I don't like the idea that there are little people inside of us, <laughs> little animated 
beings and like the real the real us is this little hidden creature inside of us i don't i just don't like that idea <laughs> maybe i'm right or wrong you know? i mean i really have come to feel that like all this like religious or even spiritual terminology it's, it's useless you know it's it's like the minute you say it, it's wrong. You know, it's like what it's a metaphor that fails to work. Anything, anything. You know? Even though I follow my guru, I have a guru and I follow what he says. And, you know, I read his books and I like his books. But the minute you say any of these things, like, oh, there's a supreme consciousness or, uh, you know, uh, the universe is alive. And it sounds wrong. It doesn't you can't catch it. The real truth is kind of beyond what we can know or particularly say. And I think you know this book. One of the strengths of this book is it doesn't start try to say too much. Well, now I'm, I open to this phrase: the dawn today was singular, radiating ecstasies of orange, lavender, and pink through the sky. Maybe that was wrong. Spiritual. And um, I'm going to ask you about your artwork next, but oh, yeah. I will show you <laughs> all throughout there are these line drawings by Sparrow himself. And here's one that I challenge you with God is right wing, the angels are socialists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That I think is true. <laughs> Seems to be pretty true. <laughs> Yeah, one time my wife and I were in Jerusalem and we went to this like really super orthodox uh, synagogue. And it was just amazing. Like people, it was like the people were kind of levitating. It felt like out of the corner of your eye, like the people were actually levitating. These are like really deeply religious, kind of super, I don't know them personally, but my suspicion is they are very, very right wing. And, um, then we went to the liberal, we walked because it was the Sabbath. We didn't want to, I didn't want to take a bus. So we walked all the way to the liberal synagogue, which was a beautiful dome, singing these beautiful songs. And it was just spiritually dead. There was no spirituality to it. And it's like, God is right wing. You know, like God like is drawn to these right wing places. And like these liberal places are just, you know, there's just no God there. I mean, I hate to say this. I'm sure you're all are liberals. I'm a whatever a socialist like the angels, but uh, uh, it's just my opinion. <laughs> also, my dad is an old communist, and my dad told me the same. I mean, Martin Luther King was a genius and figured out a way to make religion into a brilliance, and let alone uh, Malcolm X. He was a really religious guy, more religious, I think, than uh, Malcolm X, than Martin Luther King, in my opinion. So there's a way to be religious. And it's like Jesus said, you know, like what, uh, it's easier for a, what's the word, camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Like it's harder for a religious person to have good politics than for, you know, a cow to get through a, what do you call those things we put the spaghetti in? <laughs> yeah. Strainer? Strainer. Hollander. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> It's Thank harder. You, I'm gonna say it again because I like to hear the sound of it. Yeah, it's harder for like a, a religious person to have good politics than for a cow to go through a column. <laughs> nice. So, do what music? How does that have anything to do <laughs> yeah. with Joyce Carol Oates and atheism? <laughs> yeah, that is really a good question. Yeah, I mean, towards the end of the book, and I can't remember why, <laughs> I decided to make Kalabakis like more or less a fanatic fan of do what. And uh, and then he writes a doo-wop song. That's kind of the climax of the book. And you are lucky enough that me and Lee are going to sing the doo-wop song that Malabakis wrote for for you. I was going to bring my slide flute and play a solo, but it's the it's the Jewish Sabbath. We're not supposed to play the slide flute, so you can imagine. Maybe I could like whistle it or something. <laughs> um, so we're going to do that now? Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of an untitled um, doo-wop song. And this is kind of like Kalabak. This is like the kind of the soul, I was going to say. This is kind of the, the inner life of Kalabak is at the highest level. This is kind of what he wants out of life. 
And it starts with this like in our, you know how doo has these uh, falsetto um, singing. You know? so, it, so it starts with a, a someone, an inarticulate sound sung by a falsetto singer, which I will do. <laughs> No harm, no harm, no harm. I will do you no harm, no, no harm, harm, no, no harm. harm. If you do me no harm, harm no, no harm, harm, no harm. harm. My darling, I adore you. You walk in my ring. My darling, I adore you. You swallow my shame. I will do you no harm. No harm. No harm. If you do me no harm. No harm. No harm. That's a love. My darling, never leave me. You can still sing that, but just not as loud. My darling, never leave me. I need you like bread. My darling, never leave me. I am in your debt. I will do you no harm. No harm. No harm. If you do me no harm. No harm. No harm. No harm. No harm. No harm. You're so bossy. <laughs> I know. I feel better about that. It really brings out in me <laughs> being, I'm in a band. I forgot to say it in my self description. Yeah, I'm in this group, FOMOLA. And uh, for like uh, since 90, which is what, 20, 32 years, <laughs> 91, 31 years. And I'm in other side projects. You know, I'm involved in a lot of bands in a way. And bands bring out <laughs> bands and softball. Lately, I started, my friends and I started the softball league. And I'm like fanatically competitive in softball. <laughs> and in band singing. Yeah. Are you more competitive so, than one? Than so no, I, I would just I, I would just say thank you for letting me sing with you. And I didn't mean to sing too long, but one thing that we <laughs> 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 I forgive you. We're talking about, I mean, is um in doo uh oh yeah you know which comes from an African American background of um uh uh backup singing that there's uh, uh, repercussion of the chorus and very, very uh, full of intent. And after we're talking about doo wop, I said, you know, so I'm starting to learn about rap and the hip hop culture. And it, there's some similarities between rap and doo wop, which is pretty interesting. Pretty fascinating. I mean, they're both music that kind of arise kind of organically from the street. That's one, I think when I was a kid actually, um, I would still see doo-wop singers. And for many years afterwards in New York City, you know, like under a subway platform or somewhere that echoed, you would see a few doo-wop singers uh, kind of rehearsing together and, and uh, and it's, you know, also doo-wop has been pretty much forgotten. And it's, I think, one of the great American musics. I mean, I think that was part of the reason I gave it. I think Kalavakis, you know, there's something very kind of lost about him as a person. And he maybe at, uh, attaches to doo-wop because it's kind of a lost, a lost music. And as he travels from place to place, he has these like 72 doo-wop records that he carries with him everywhere, real records. Maybe, can I read this? Because we were talking about this passage. So I was talking about, I, I got this idea um, while writing this book about the parallels between doo-wop and, uh, and what would you call it? The trans movement, sex change operations, which according to my research, they both started around the same time. And, 
when you listen to a doo-wop song and the person is singing in falsetto, you don't quite know what sex they are. It's kind of like a point where the, the, something ha happened with technology that they could create this music. You hear it on the radio and you don't know if the person's a man or a woman. So I wrote about this. The first doo-wop song was 1950. The first sex change operation was Christine Jorgensen in 1951. Both of these innovations question the boundaries of gender. The black musicians who invented doo-wop realized that recorded music is anonymous. You can't see the singers. Therefore, you can't know who's a man and who's a woman. And what does it mean to be a woman? Auditorily, it means to have a high voice. The sound of a high falsetto breaking free of the chanted backdrop is the sound of a male transforming into a female. <clears throat> How about questions? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone seems utterly stunned. <laughs> we still have a few a few minutes before we need to go to questions. If you want to discuss that segment, I'd love to hear your no, go, 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 go for it. <clears throat> well, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, you know, like I say, I have one paragraph to say about everything. I don't know that I have more than that to say about it. I mean, I, I think that there is something. I mean, I feel it too, you know, that in me, I feel that uh, there's something happening with gender something that's organically changing in the way that we see gender. Uh, every, everybody, or at least in this country. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel that somewhat liberated personally by it. Um, I've been thinking about, there was a guy I knew when I lived in the East Village. He was older than me, kind of a mentor to me. And, uh, and one day he said to me, I used to wonder if I was gay or if I was straight. And then after, a, after years of wondering, I realized I'm never gonna know. <laughs> and he was like a really deeply spiritual guy, very simple. I think he probably worked as a uh, legal proofreader. Like everybody I knew worked at night as a legal proofreader. I have a vague memory that he did that too. And he was just a very sunny Midwestern, sweet guy who seemed to me very old and is probably younger than I am now. And I, I just found that very impressive. You know, really something changed in me when he said that. To me. Live your whole life. I guess a little bit connected to what I was saying about doubt, actually. You can live, you don't have to have an identity. You don't have to have fall into any category sexually, gender-wise. And I, I don't know, I just feel like the like it's giving me permission to be less of a man because I'm I don't like men I, you know when I'm at a party and there's men standing around the real men the ones that discuss you know crankcases and carburetors and football and war or whatever the hell they talk about I don't I don't even know well enough to know what they talk about but I just get terrified by just thinking about it and uh, this friend of mine, just a friend of mine who's a kind of a famous writer, just became a woman. And my friend was telling me about it. And she said, well, you know, he was always, I mean, I never thought of him as a woman, but he would, when, when the, after the meal, when the men would talk in one place, the women would talk in the other place, he would always be with the women. Hmm. And I thought, God, that's what I do. You know, so, it, you know, I just think, I'm just kind of happy that, I'm hoping, you know, I'm in a way, of, because of my dad, I'm in a way I'm a very, like I like to call myself a vulgar Marxist. Like I just want to destroy the ruling class and, uh, you know, have some kind of socialist paradise. And, it, and I worry that, uh, and this book is completely apolitical, by the way, but uh, I worry that all this gender stuff is, you know, from a traditional vulgar Marcus, Marxist perspective, it's a distraction. But I'm hoping that it's all tied in together. You know, I have a certain amount of hope and a certain amount of faith that it is tied in together. Mm. That if we can destroy gender in some way, or that we are destroying gender, whether we want to or not, it it will eventually destroy the ruling class.
Yes. <laughs> So, How's that for a description? So, of, yeah, awesome. So, <laughs> I really did not expect to say that. Yeah, no. Um, so maybe my last question before we open for others is, uh, so you've done a zillion interviews and you've just written, you're the longest writer for Sun Magazine, which is quite extraordinary. Is there anything people don't ask you that you wish they would? Hmm. I mean, I don't get interviewed that often. I mean, I suppose I, you know, what I think I like talking about the most is uh, is music. And I mean, that's what I'm kind of like, you know, like I was saying, I'm very married and I've kind of learned over the years that I cannot really talk to my wife about, for example, about um, like I'm video mourning, uh, Charlie Watts of the Rolling Stones. I'm very embarrassed about this, but that's what I'm doing. And I'm like thinking about the Rolling Stones and trying to understand the Rolling Stones. And I, I was really against, I mean, I'm against them politically <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and their whole mystique, I find really boring. This idea, oh yeah, they take a lot of drugs or something. <laughs> that makes them cool. Or whatever the mystique is about them, it just seems really dumb. Let alone, you know, I'm against people stealing black music and making billions of dollars out of it. On the other hand, I'm kind of interested in them lately. You know, and I just find them, I like these songs that they, they kept making songs after everybody stopped listening to them. And some of their songs are better than the songs they used to make that are kind of, what's the word? You know, classic rock hits. They have this song, Saint of Me. Look it up, Saint of Me. It's an amazing song that no one will ever know exists. I think it's 1997. Anyway, that is the kind of boring thing I want to be asked about. <laughs> what are your thoughts about the Rolling Stones as of today? <laughs> well, on that note, we can open the floor for questions. From the <laughs> and, I, and I know this group is going to ask. <laughs> uh, if you can just about use a raised hand gavels. to let me know that you have a question, we can go and get started that way. Oh, yeah. yeah good old John. I have a question. Um, it could just be the way you were talking about it, but there were times when discussing the writing of the book that you mentioned we would say phrases like, I included this, or I wrote this passage. But then there are other times where you discuss it in a way of like, I discovered in the book that so-and-so said such, or, you know, huh. I, you know, just recently recalled upon opening it, like this passage. And I'm curious, like, I know, like, what's a good way to synthesize this question? Some poets talk about, you know, the poet, like the poem coming to them, right? Uh -huh. Versus writing the poem. Right. And I know that to, to a degree, both schools of thought are like doing the same thing. Yes, even if the poem does come to them, they're still writing the poem. Right. And even the poet who writes the poem still comes to some sort of inspiration. But to what extent do you like, what's your like balance, like scales wise, if at all, of what do you feel like comes from you and what do you feel like arrives to you? That makes any sense. Well, I mean, it's funny, like, like I said, I'm in this state every morning. I do this every day that I don't talk until noon. And, you know, sometimes my friends will say, oh, I know you're in a state of meditation in the morning. And I'm like, that's not true. On the other hand, if my wife says once in a while, she'll say like, you know, I'm leaving at two o'clock and I'm like, I wish you would not say that, you know, because it's like I'm in this kind of weird state in every morning that is, I don't know what it is. I, I don't think, I don't feel that, the, that the, the gods are dictating the book to me. On the other hand, um, I mean, some of it I think is kind of inspired. I thought that passage about doo-wop and sex change operations, you know, was kind of brilliant. Maybe not divinely inspired or whatever but um yes I, I have a bad memory so i don't i don't remember a lot of what so, so when i read even though i read the book recently when i look at it i open it i find a lot of things i don't remember writing i i i don't know i, I there was one poem that i wrote that was my most successful poem because i also write a lot of poems, thousands of poems um that that uh, i felt was i felt it came to me um but i 
in general, I, I don't, I don't worry about it, I think. I mean, I think that, you know, my advice to people that want to be writers is just write. I mean, if you want to be a writer, why not write? And, and I spent a year traveling actually to my guru. I spent a year traveling to get to my guru. And during that year, I decided I'm going to write down everything that happens this whole year. And, you know, and then I would go to different countries and I'd get the, you know, they have these like little composition books for kids in school. So every country has those, it turns out. Um, and I would buy one and I'd write it and I'd try to write everything that happened. And, it, you know, it was a big breakthrough kind of for me. So, I mean, I think it's, I'm, if anything, I'm on the opposite side. Like, don't wait for inspiration, just write, push it you know, force it. But, but, you know, I'm not sure what other people should do. I mean, I, it's just what I do. Any other questions? Also, for those of you watching at home, you can type your questions oh, into yeah. the chat and I will ask them out loud. Oh. We've got little people in here watching too. <laughs> oh yeah, little souls. Yeah. Little souls. <laughs> yeah. Those do seem like souls. Oh. I have, a, I have a question and I'm not sure how to formulate it. Yeah. So you can answer any way you want or okay. any other question that you imagine and say. Yeah. <laughs> it, it has to do with your body, your personal body. Okay. Because I know you meditate a lot. You also have a presentation aesthetic. Right. And Good point. I'm wondering when you write, do you write from your body? <laughs> That's a really good question. You should ask everyone else that. Uh, do I write for my I don't think so. I don't see myself as writing for my body. I mean, I wish I did. I think it's the best way to write. Offhand. You know, like I was I am I am I had this mentor, this poetry mentor, Ted Berrigan, and I was just writing about him and I was saying that he wrote from his whole body. And he was like a big fat speed freak. <laughs> he was a fat speed freak, which is interesting in itself. And uh, uh, I, but you feel when you read his poems that his whole body is present in his poems. I mean, you know, I do write about masturbating, but even then, I, I mean, I would like to think I'm writing for my body, but I, I feel like I'm, I'm very divorced from my body, and I regret it. And I think that meditation hasn't really helped, but I could be wrong. I think really you should do something more like Tai Chi or something. Something where you center yourself and you feel your physical center. If you want to get in touch with your body, I think meditation is too mental. <laughs> On the other hand, you sit there, you know, so you sort of notice that your body hurts. <laughs> we have a musician here, Ben. Oh, yeah. Question? Uh, I'm just. My my biggest question was when you started writing the book. Did you know you were writing a book, or did you? Oh yeah, have, you talked about piecing things together. Well, oh, you know, songs are written sometimes too. Yeah, I um, I was going to tell the story of how I wrote this book, which I think I dedicated to my friend, um, because it's kind of a funny story that I uh, um. I have this friend who lives in a squad in the suburbs of Paris. He's like my age, but he, he lives with sort of a bunch of anarchists outside of Paris. And he has one of those pedicabs, you know, he like bicycles around on it with tourists on the back. Um, so he and I were going to write this book together. We're gonna, we got this idea to write a novel together. But he was insistent that we do it um, with um, by letter, by physically writing letters. And it just started to look like it was never gonna happen. You know, it was just too cumbersome, kind of expensive to send letters to Paris a lot. So I started writing this book with, you know, this was gonna be the book we were writing together. Then he dropped out and then I continued writing it. So I think I think I thought I was writing a novel or a novella. Or you know, I mean, as I, re I recall, my opinion was that I was writing a long manuscript. I mean, it has no plot, 
So it, you know, my wife recently wrote this. My wife writes a lot of novels and she just self-published her, the first one. And she, you know, has a plot, she has a, uh, an outline, you know, she has it all worked out. She's trying to get you involved in the character on the first page. You know, I'm, I maybe you can tell, but not exactly doing that. On the other hand, I did, yeah, I wanted it to be a book. I like writing books. I mean, as opposed to writing little things. It's kind of dignified to write a book. <laughs> you seem like a very dignified man. Well, that's kind of insane. Suspicious of you. <laughs> I mean, probably. I think my dad asked me, my 102-year-old dad asked me the other day, like, did you always want to be a writer? Why did you become a writer? And I said, I don't remember, but I do think that I, my, you know, my parents had a lot of books and they had kind of a reverential feeling about books. My father saved, he was in the Navy in World War II, saved his like naval manual. He still has it. It's a beautiful blue, it looks like a Bible, blue cover, deep blue cover. You know, books like that, uh, Dead Souls by Gogol. I grew up looking at these books and thinking books are really magical. But the real reason I became a writer actually was because I became a hippie. I dropped out of society, I flunked out of college. And I, my big breakthrough in life is I realized I spend so little money. I just have to work part time. That's like all, you know, this little different in 1974, but anyway, um, you know, where my rent was $45 a month. But um, uh, anyway, I, I just realized, I just stopped working all the time. I just worked, stopped working half the week. So I had a lot of time <laughs> and I just, and I would write my friend's letters. And then I saw, started thinking, I guess I'm gonna copy these letters into my journal. And that's really how I became a writer. I just started copying the letters into my, and you know, you start changing a word or two, start editing. And it just, just because I had too much time. <laughs> That's why I, I you know, started writing, it's weird. And a lot of people say to me, well, I don't have time to write. You know, I'm like, hmm, funny, I was the opposite. Still, I'm the opposite. You have to really, I mean, if you want to be a writer, you have to allow yourself a vast amount of time to do nothing. Like, that is my opinion. You know, it's really, it's hard to do in any other way. You have to really feel like I'm going to waste my life and do nothing. That should be your, your thought. <laughs> I'm going to spend a life accomplishing nothing. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, we have about 20 minutes, 20 minutes before the store closes, so we can either answer another question or dissolve into mingling with the wine and the cookies and whatnot. So, you know, it's kind of up to you mm. which you prefer to do now. I think it's dissolved time, yes? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you both so much for coming. Oh, yeah. uh, this has been such an amazing conversation. So so pleased that we were we had the privilege of having you both join us today, um, and I hope to see you again soon. Uh, can we close with um, where can our guests and viewers keep up with your work if they want to? Oh yes, yeah, that's doing? a very good question. Um, well, I'm Sparrow X Carter on uh, Facebook. Sparrow X middle middle initial X. I was trying to change my name to Sparrow X, like Malcolm X. Um, Sparrow X Carter. I'm on um, beautiful Twitter. I'm a Twitter addict. Uh, Sparrow 14, at Sparrow 14, I think it is on Twitter. Uh, I don't have a, whatever those things are called, website. <laughs> <laughs> and The Sun, you can go to The Sun Magazine, thesunmagazine.org. Look up Sparrow. And you'll see my 103 articles. Wonderful. And Lee, where we, can we find your work? PoetLeeWoodman.com. The exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I know.
know, we're we're different. <laughs> Next time I'm going to interview her because I just read her new book. Fabulous. Yeah. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. You might be able to come back and see Lee here in, uh, in pretty soon. It'd be funny, right? If everybody came back. <laughs> yeah. It's the opposite. Stranger things have happened. Oh, oh. Are you all? Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. <laughs> Feel free to partake. Have a good evening. Be safe. Be good. Oh, right. Be beautiful. Oh.